Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, I'm delighted we're going to be speaking to Dr. Susie Imber, who is an Associate Professor of Planetary Science at the University of Leicester. She's also a mountaineer, a rower, a rock climber and a runner. So Susie, if you were to introduce yourself and to tell everybody a little bit more about you, what would you say? Oh, okay. So um, my job, I'm an Associate Professor of Planetary Science at the University of Leicester. So that takes up a lot of my time. Um, But I also love to go exploring, mountaineering. Um, I love sports, so running and all sorts of things. So kind of I love sport and being outside, um, but I'm also a scientist. Oh my God, absolutely love it. It's a great combination to have. So a doctor of planetary science sounds fantastic. And I love the fact you do all these exploring and you love running and the mountains. So take us back to to the start. I mean, tell us a little bit more about your family and growing up. Were you, did you come from like an academic family, a sporty family or or both? Yeah, I came from both actually. So my parents were, uh, are academic. They both, um, my dad's engineering, my mum did maths at university and they both kind of, um, carried on with that so um, an academic background definitely but also a really sporty one so uh, my mum was an international field hockey player um, and my dad was a rugby player and a rower and a runner so um, I've always kind of had those influences in my life ever since I was young. What were your sports what did you get into were you were you doing the hockey as well rugby and running? Uh, so I could never live up to uh, my my mum's hockey ability so I didn't play hockey I played lacrosse that was my sport uh, I probably played it for about 10 years just every day. I went to a school that was the National Academy for lacrosse and we just played every single day. So we trained really hard um, and, and did well. So that was my main sport. So how did it, did your sport and fitness continue to sort of evolve with your academic studies? Yes. So I trained harder and harder as I went on through um, my school education Um, and then when I left school went to university I joined uh, the university uh, lacrosse team Um, and again we trained pretty hard we did pretty well and that was University of London because I was at Imperial College London for my degree Um, and then I really took up running as well while I was at university and I took up martial arts as well I took up kung fu and uh, and ever since then I've really just carried on with a whole range of different sports so it's always been part of my life yeah tell us more about the, the mountaineering when did mountains start to play a part in your life I left London I finished my undergrad and I moved to Leicester to do a PhD and there wasn't a lot of lacrosse up here in the Midlands and I'd have had to have done a lot of traveling um there were weekend camps that I had to go to and I just couldn't keep up with with everything so I decided that I would change tack a little bit um and I took up rowing and I took up high altitude mountaineering. So that's kind of when it all started. Probably in my early mid twenties, I really seriously took up rowing and climbing. Why did you decide on like high altitude mountaineering? I think I'd always been interested in climbing mountains. I'd always been interested in going to new places. When I was little and I was growing up, I really admired the the Antarctic explorers from a hundred years ago. So Scott and Shackleton and all of those stories, that was who I, that's what I wanted to be an, an explorer. Um, and so when I had the chance to think about taking up a new sport, mountaineering really appealed to me. So that was uh, a no brainer, really. So where did it first sort of start? I mean, did it, did it start in the, in the UK? I mean, obviously, I don't, I don't think we actually have any like high altitude mountains in the UK. <laughs> but did you start climbing in the UK or, or did you sort of go straight into it with, with, the, higher, with the high altitude mountains? I didn't take a conventional approach. Um, so after I left Imperial, as my, after my undergrad, I went to South America with my brother. Um, we spent a few months in South America and we wanted to climb a mountain, or I wanted to climb a mountain. So we climbed a mountain in Bolivia called Guanapotosu, which is a 6,000 meter mountain, 6,088 meters. Um, and that was the first mountain I climbed, basically. So I just kind of went straight in for a, for a South American 6,000. Um, and it was really brutal. I had no skills. Um, and really suffered on that ascent, as did my brother. We both managed to get to the top, but it was really hard work, um, really brutal. And he hasn't climbed since, and that was the beginning of my journey. So that's how it all started. Was that with like a group, or was it just the two of you sort of saying, "Oh, look at that mountain! Let's let's go for it"? How did it sort of happen? 
Yeah, well, it was the two of us saying, oh, what, you know, where can we climb? And then we we paid a guide to take us. So, yeah, it was just us uh, and a, a local guide who knew um, knew the way and, and knew how to teach us the skills we needed. So, yeah, it was just us. Why was it so brutal? What was it about the experience that you can remember back now? Gosh, I've never been to altitude before, so I didn't know what to expect. I didn't recognise the symptoms of high altitude sickness that we were getting, uh, didn't really know what was happening. Uh, I hadn't done a lot of climbing on ice before, so I had to learn how to climb ice, so crampons and ice axes, some of it's quite steep. Um, and our ascent was rapid um, because uh, we paid a guide and he, he wanted us to climb it in just a couple of days. So we didn't know any better, so we followed him and um, it was cold, windy, and you leave in the middle of the night to go and climb these mountains. So you climb for maybe, you know, eight hours to reach the summit and then, you know, come back down again early afternoon. And I just remember being so exhausted. We were just falling over with exhaustion. It was um, really quite an, quite an interesting beginning, I think. I mean, it's always interesting, like the words you use, you know, it was brutal, dealing with the altitude sickness. It was cold. It was windy, falling over, the exhaustion. And yet you said that was like the start of your journey. But, you know, unfortunately for your brother, he was like, nah, I'm done. I've, 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 I've <laughs> climbed one 6,000 meter vital a mountain. I've ticked that box. But for you, what was it and how did you almost progress and move move forward with your mountaineering? Well, I think I think the, the key to being a good high altitude mountaineer is having a really bad memory and being able to put the bad experiences behind you and focus on the good ones. So I came down and I thought, gosh, that's awful. I don't want to climb again. That was really, really bad. Um, but yet in the back of my mind was the memory of sitting on the summit. The summit of this mountain is a knife edge. So you sit with one leg either side of this sort of steep um, knife edge of a, of a summit ridge. And we watched the sunrise over the entire mountain range as we got up there. And those memories stayed with me and the memories of the pain um, kind of faded away. And that's always the case. Every mountain we go to, uh, there are bad times. And um, I think focusing on the positive memories makes you want to keep going back. Yeah, oh, definitely. So, I mean, did you? how did you go about developing your skills? Was it a case, did you book yourself on any courses? Was it just learning why you were climbing your next set of mountains? Like, how did your mountaineering skills evolve? Well, I didn't really have any money. I was doing my PhD um, and I was trying to work other jobs as well to save enough money to go climbing. So I, um, it wasn't like I could go and book on some course in the Alps or somewhere like that. So I decided what I would do was just save up as much money as I could and go to another mountain and try and learn more skills as I went. So I chose a, a non-technical mountain in South America called Aconcagua, which is the highest mountain in the southern and western hemispheres. So it's, it's again, it's, it's the highest I've been actually even now. It's 6,968 metres. Um, and because it's non-technical, I thought I would learn more about some of the other skills required, like how to deal with altitude, how to cope with spending weeks on the mountain, all that kind of thing. So I really just learnt through experience rather than through teaching. Yeah, tell us more about about that. Uh, the mountain. I, I hate saying it, Aconcagua. <laughs> but, yeah, Aconcagua. Yeah. Right. So uh, I climbed. I went again. Uh, paid someone to show me the way. And um, there were two clients and two guides, and we headed out to the mountain. Um, we attempted to summit, got forced back by terrible weather. Went back up the mountain again, got forced back again. And at that point, our two guides said, you know, we're, we're done. We're running out of time. It's, it's time for us to go back. And me and the other client said, wait a minute. No way. We're not going back now. So the guides left uh, and we carried on just the two of us and managed to summit that mountain. So, um, again, slightly unconventional approach there, uh, climbing without a guide. But I really learned some skills on that trip. I really kind of learned how to survive up there in those high altitudes and actually determination um, and not giving up is what gets you through in the end. Yeah. I mean, what, what was the impact on your body being at high altitude? That first, the first few mountains, especially up in Kaiba, that took us sort of a month to climb. Um, again, I wasn't really, I didn't really know enough about um, the high altitude symptoms that I was experiencing. So I wasn't eating enough food. I lost my appetites as as most people do. And I I lost my sense of thirst as well. So you don't want to drink anything. You don't want to eat anything. And your body is really going through a tough time. So you're carrying, we didn't have any anyone to carry any of our kit for us. So you're carrying a lot of heavy kit up the mountain. Um, so I lost a lot of weight on that first mountain. I came back looking pretty bad. Um, but 
after that, I began looking into what kind of food do I need? What does my body need to survive at these altitudes? How many calories do I need? What kind of food can I realistically carry? So that was a massive learning experience for me. And when I went back to the next mountain, I was much better prepared with the right nutrition and the right food. Oh, fantastic. What was the next mountain? I went to Alaska um, with the same person that I climbed up and cabled with, actually. We went together 18 months later to Alaska to climb a mountain called Denali, which is um, the highest mountain in North America. Um, it's pretty well renowned because the weather there is brutal the conditions are brutal there are about a thousand attempts and maybe 500 summits every year um very few of them women i don't know why i guess it's just a, a, a tough environment um and we decided to go without a guide so uh, from that moment onwards I, I never had a guide i just kind of did my research worked out where i wanted to go and then set my own route so we went together um and managed eventually to summit this mountain denali what happened on the way? It sounds like that was quite a challenging expedition. It was really tough. Um, we had a lot of kit and equipment because we had no one else, just the two of us um, and no guide. We had to take a lot of extra equipment just in case something went wrong. So we had a lot of weight to carry. We were pulling sledges. And I've been training by dragging uh, car tires around the park in Leicester. So we was trying to train to get used to kind of what it's like to drag a sledge and carry weight. Um, but actually, you know, when you're there and it's freezing, freezing cold because it is just incredibly cold at that mountain, um, it's a different experience. It takes a bit of getting used to. Um, so it took us five weeks to get to the summit because we got really high on the mountain and a massive storm came in quite suddenly and we were stuck in our tent for 12 days. So um, the winds were so high we couldn't leave the tent. We'd lashed it to the ice with rope which meant the ceiling of the tent had come down so low we couldn't even sit up in our own tent. And we just sat in that tent for 12 days, waited and waited and waited until the bad weather passed and then managed to make it to the summit. <laughs> sorry, I'm literally like, oh my God. I mean, so who's your, sorry, who's your partner on these, on these adventures? Well, that, I was climbing with a friend back then um, who was sort of gone in different climbing directions now. Um, but yeah, he was a friend that I'd met on the previous mountain. He was the other client on Aconcagua who I'd summited with. Um, so we carried on climbing together for a few years. What, what was it like being in a tent just for 12 days with, you know, with the wind and blow, howling around you? You know, did you not go stir crazy? It's interesting what happens, actually. So thankfully, we get along really well. So we didn't end up rowing with each other or anything. Um, but it's interesting what happens. You kind of switch off. So there's a, it turns out if you can't leave the tent and you're just stuck inside it, you sleep a lot. So we found ourselves sleeping a lot, um, which is not what you need when you're about to go for a summit. But um, we take we took a Kindle with us so we could read some books. I spent a lot of time reading, um, a lot of time monitoring the outside conditions, um, trying to monitor how much food we had and a lot of time melting ice and snow to make water which is what we needed uh, a lot of water that helps you overcome the altitude so you meant to drink liters and liters and liters every day and for us up there there's no source of water except ice so you spend hours a day just melting water melting ice to make water um making some food um thankfully as i said we were really well prepared because we were worried this would happen so we had a lot of food and a lot of fuel unlike some of the other teams that were up there uh, and so we were able just to wait for the wind to die down, but not knowing when it's going to die down and being really in the early days, really worried the tent's going to get ripped, um, ripped off around you and disappear, leaving you without really any shelter is quite hard mentally. How do you cope with that mentally? Well, I think, you know, you do everything you can to prepare before you go. So you think about the worst case scenario, you try and plan for it as best you can. And if that actually happens, then at least you kind of have a plan in mind. You may probably have the equipment that you need to try and deal with it. Other than that, you know, it's really out of your hands. What will happen will happen. And you just need to try and, you know, stay mentally sharp so that you can cope with any eventuality that comes your way and try and stay as healthy as you can so you're ready um, in case you need to either get down or, or climb up. So, you know, there's not a lot you can do except try and be prepared. Yeah. What was summit like night on, on Denali? So it was interesting because we'd been at that top camp for so long and basically everyone else had left because they didn't have enough food and fuel and weren't coping well with the conditions. As soon as the wind dropped, anyone remaining at that camp uh, basically dropped down because they 
they were not ready for a summit. Whereas we were healthy and ready to go. So as we went up to the summit, there weren't very many people there at all. Um, really just a handful of people as we reached the summit, which is unusual for Tenali. So um, we were really fortunate in that. And actually the view on these mountains is amazing. You look out over hundreds of miles of frozen wilderness. Um, it was so beautiful. I just, I remember that to this day. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, you, you've, you've, you've climbed these in, incredible mountains. I just be almost interested. It's like, how have you managed to fit in that around your, your PhD? I mean, do you get time off during the summer to, to, to spend five or six weeks sort of out, out mountaineering or how does that work? Well, the problem for me is that the season, the mountaineering season is winter. So at the moment I'm climbing a lot in the Andes. Um, Andes season is probably October, November, December, January, February, maybe, um, depending on where, which latitude you're climbing at. Um, so for obviously now I'm, I'm an academic at a university, I don't have that time um, to spare because I'm meant to be teaching during term time and I have a big research program here, PhD students to look after and postdocs and all that kind of thing. So I find it really hard. Um, at the moment, what I've been doing is trying to squash all my teaching into one semester or the other. Uh, and then applying for for leave, essentially for unpaid leave to go and do this. Um, but another aspect that I've been introducing, which has really been helping me, is that it turns out there's a lot of research programmes that need samples from the mountains, but the academics are not capable of going to those places and collecting those samples. So I've been doing much more science in the mountains over the last few years, um, maybe taking ice and rock samples from under a glacier, or taking salt samples from evaporated lakes, and inside these samples, we find bacteria that they're called extremophiles and they've evolved to survive in this extreme environment. So I bring those samples back to the university and send them to universities all over the world. And they analyze them to, to analyze kind of how these bacteria have evolved. And um, actually at the university, we're building an instrument that's going to go to Mars on the next Mars rover. And that instrument is designed to look for life. So I'm bringing these samples back and then we're using them to test our instrument to see what, what we would detect if we found this kind of bacteria on Mars. Oh so you see how it works. Data collection is becoming part of the mountaineering for me now. That's amazing. And then do you also then get your mountaineering expeditions funded because you're going to collect the samples? Well, that would be a dream, wouldn't it? But sadly, <laughs> no. <laughs> sadly, no. So again, I'm, you know, always just saving all my spare pennies to, to head out to the mountains. Um, no, we don't get them funded. We had some funding for an expedition a couple of years ago um, from the Mount Everest Foundation and the British Mountaineering Council, and that managed to cover at least my flight out to the Andes. But um, it's hard to get full expeditions covered. Um, yeah, it doesn't happen yeah. often, not for me. So, so was that was that um, was that when you were heading out to the a remote corner of the Andes to to catalogue and and scale new mountains? Was was that the project? Yeah, so the project came about because um, my climbing partner, Max, and I, we had been wondering for a long time about the list of mountains in the Andes. And we discovered that the existing list was made by uh, a chap about 30 years ago with a map and a pencil. And he very accurately um, located a lot of the mountains in the Andes. But Max is trying to climb all of the 6,000 metre mountains in the Andes. Um, and he and I go on many expeditions to try and scale these these really remote mountains. Um, and we wanted a definitive list. And so what we decided to do was uh, get some data from the Earth Observation Science Department here at the university. And I have access to the supercomputer here at the university as well. So I was able to write some computer codes to analyze 1.6 billion data points as part of my um, my Andes data file. Uh, and identify for the first time all of the mountains over 5,000 metres and over 6,000 metres in the Andes in a really objective way. So not someone's opinion, but actually mathematically define a mountain and find all of those mountains. Um, it turns out you need a supercomputer to do that. So thankfully, I had access at the university and that gave me the ability to write this code. So in the process, we found dozens of mountains that weren't on previous lists and that didn't have names and that we didn't think had ever been climbed. And so immediately we started writing some grant proposals to some mountaineering societies like the Mount Everest Foundation to try to get some money together to head off and climb as many of these unclimbed mountains as we could. Oh my God, I was going to say, carry on, tell me more. What, what happened? <laughs> did, you get, did you get the funding? So we did, we got some funding. Um, we got about £3,000 from the Mount Everest Foundation and another 1000 I think, from the British Mountaineering Council. Um, bearing in mind that at that point I was 
um, trying to buy flights for me to get out there, trying to buy some insurance in case things went wrong. So it covered some of the costs and the rest was, was just covered um, by Max and I. And we departed um, and climbed 10 mountains in a couple of months. Um, some of these, as I mentioned, we didn't think anyone had ever climbed before. And when we got to the summit of some of them, we found Incan ruins. So we found that the Incas 500 or so years before had built small towers called Apachecas on the summit of these mountains. They had been climbed before, um, but not in modern day times. So to discover something that someone has built all that time before on the summit of a mountain when you finally struggled your way to the top is just incredible. Um, and now we're working with a high altitude uh, archaeology department to catalogue these ruins and try to work out why the Incas climbed those mountains and why they built those those small towers on the top. Oh my god, that's amazing! And even I mean, because I've been to like Machu Picchu in, in Peru and seeing like the, the Inca stuff is just is just phenomenal. So I can't imagine what it'd be like being in these incredibly remote places in the Andes and getting to the summit of a mountain and finding them up there. Mm. And then so. Uh, a little bit of an interesting question. Do you get to name any of the mountains? Is there a is there a Susie Imba mountain somewhere in the Andes? It's a good question. Um, actually, we do because they don't have names at the moment. But um, we have uh, looked at history and discovered that naming mountains after yourself in a foreign country is not the best idea. It doesn't um, it doesn't always go down so well. So actually, what we do is we name them after a local feature. So maybe there's a lake somewhere a few tens of kilometres away that does have a name and we'll name the mountain maybe after the lake or another local feature. Oh, no, do you know what? That's, a, that's such a good point because I'm just thinking of like colonial, colonialism. If that's exactly, a- no, exactly. So if you think about Denali, the name for Denali in North America um, is McKinley, which was named after an American president. Um, and that's just caused such trouble over the years that they're now, you know, officially thinking about, about changing it back to its original name, Denali, rather than McKinley. But yeah, as you say, going to a mountain and kind of putting your stamp on it with your name is, is doesn't, I don't think, um, engender goodwill. No. I mean, it just must be an incredible experience, but also because it's so new and, I mean, I mean, how many 5,000 or 6,000 uh, people, how many fi- how many are mountains are there over 5000 or over th- over 6000 there are 106 6000 meter mountains in the andes and there are 1148 5000 meter mountains awesome and how many of the over the 6000 peaks have you climbed i've done i don't know something around 15 or 20 and um, my friend max he's climbed 84 so we are heading towards our our goal which is climbing all of them um, and actually, an expedition I just came back from um, a month ago, we climbed the last mountains on the list in Argentina and Chile. So um, we'd left some pretty tough mountains till the end. Um, and we just spent a month climbing the final two for Max in Chile and Argentina. So our next goal is going to be Peru. Oh, fantastic. I mean, and when you are heading out and doing these new climbs, so you know people haven't climbed them in modern times, how mm. do you go about figuring out like route planning? That's a really interesting question. And actually, it's taken us years to gain the skills we need for this. So I first started climbing 10 years ago, maybe maybe a bit more. Um, and, and Max has been climbing for maybe 15 years. So together, we sit down with all the aerial footage we can. Um, when we're climbing, we often take mount- pictures of the surrounding mountains so that we have some pictures to look at for the next climbs. And we plan a route as best we can using our knowledge of the terrain and what the terrain looks like overhead compared to what it looks like when you're on the ground. That's the real key. So the last expedition we went on, um, we had to climb a valley that no one had ever climbed before. And it turned out that the valley was full of ice. It was a glacier, but the glacier was covered in dust. So it looked like rock. Um, And we were able to use the overhead footage that we have from Google Earth, for example, to work out that it was in fact a glacier, calculate where the crevasses were, and uh, try and plot a route. And of course, when you get there, you you soon realise that it wasn't as accurate as you had hoped. And you have to be fluid. Plans have to change and evolve when you discover, in our case, a massive 200 metre diameter, 200 deep, metre deep hole in the in the glacier that you're trying to, to cross. You have to change what you're doing and, and think about a different route. So again, we have a primary plan and some backup plans in case it goes wrong. But Really, um, you just have to to be able to change your perspective on the fly um, and work out the best route when you're there. Absolutely. I mean, how have you found that that 
have you found that mountaineering has or what you've learned from from being a mountaineer and you know summiting these these mountains and and getting to to have these experiences have you found that that's impacted on your academic career or your academic life well that's a good question um there's a few aspects here so obviously being away from the department for months at a time is not great for your academic career um in some senses, because you're, you're losing working time throughout the year. Uh, but on the other hand, for me, I find that being away and having something to look forward to, having something to plan and then just disappearing for a month or for two months to the middle of nowhere with no contact with the outside world really refreshes my mind. So this is what I need to do. I need to escape for a while. I need to get some new perspective um, and then come back really refreshed. And actually, perspective is the key because we worry so much about the small things in life. You know, there's a traffic jam, we get frustrated or, you know, they haven't got the type of pasta I wanted in the supermarket. But actually going to the mountains, what I'm worried about up there is, do I have enough food to survive? Am I going to freeze to death? Or do I have the right kind of equipment? You know, is there a crevasse I'm about to fall down? Do I have the energy to climb this mountain? What's the route? You know, how much time do I have? What's the weather doing? So it really takes you back to the fundamentals of survival. And actually, when you come back again, you just feel as though you're now focusing on the important things in life and maybe not getting so hung up on the small things. So I actually find mountaineering really helpful um, for, for my academic life. I mean, do you, do you find it difficult to adjust when you come back from these expeditions and, you know, being in these remote environments where it's just sort of you and Max out there and it, it's just focusing on the basics, food, water, hydration, you know, where you're going. And then suddenly you're coming back into the academic world and it's it's teaching and it's writing and you know and it's running the department well yeah department of physics and astronomy and you know all of that sort of stuff how, how does how do you find that that adjustment period that's a really good question yeah I find it really hard so when I first come back um what happens is that you've I've been living in the dirt for for months the ice or the dirt and the dust and you definitely revert back to being a little bit feral so on the last trip <laughs> We cut down on weight so much. We ran out of food. Um, we didn't have uh, enough water at various times. We didn't even take a toothbrush because we didn't want to carry it. Didn't have sleeping mats, you know, been sleeping on the ground. So you very much kind of revert into a slightly feral person. So coming back in is really hard for me because I come straight back into the department often. I've got hundreds of students to teach. Um, there's people all around me. I feel overwhelmed by the noise and the activity um, and the demands that other people make of my time when I'm used to, you know, planning my own time because no one's making any demands of me. So um, I find even going to the supermarket almost impossible because there's people everywhere. It seems so loud. Um, it's hard to make choices and make decisions about stupid small things, you know, the way that we do. Um, so it takes me weeks to get back into to, to life down here again. Yeah. I mean, one of the first places that I actually saw you as I was watching uh, the BBC Two astronaut show um, at, a, at a later date. And it was basically about training to be a candidate. You know, do you have what it takes to be uh, a candidate going into into space? I was just, I'd love to hear more about, you know, how you heard about this opportunity and how it came about and why you decided to go for it. Well, I heard about it when I was in the mountains. So I'd been climbing for a couple of months and I'd come down, Max and I had come down. We needed food and fuel and we were exhausted. We just needed a break. So we came back down from the mountains for 24 hours um, and I turned on my work computer. Thought I'd better check my work emails as you do. Obviously thousands popped up pretty rapidly, but one of them was from the BBC saying, um, do you want to be an astronaut? So I was feeling fairly flippant at the time. So I replied and said, yeah, sure, I want to be an astronaut. Why not? Um, and much to my surprise, a couple of weeks later, when I came down again, um, I had this email from the BBC saying, can we Skype you for an interview? So I replied and said, oh, you know, sorry, I'm in the Andes. I'm high up a mountain in Argentina. Skype's not going to work up here. Um, and I think that was kind of what made them interested in me as a candidate, because obviously I'd written down on the application form, I'm a, a scientist and, you know, I'm an athlete and all these things. Um, but then they sort of thought, well, who is this person in the mountains? What's she doing there? Um, so that's kind of how the whole journey started for me, really, um, just while I was climbing. So talk to us about about the show and what happened, because I, I think there was like 11 other people with you. It was a six week program where you, yeah, you, you explain it. So there were thousands of applicants and over the next few months, so I'd just come back from the mountains, I had a ton of work to do. I was overwhelmed with students and 
um, all the lectures I was preparing, the research I was doing. And I was also going to London to um, to be part of, of the programme. So every few weeks we'd have to go down there and they would do some kind of selection test to narrow down from thousands to the final 12. So this process took a few months um, and I couldn't tell anyone what I was doing. So they wanted us to, they were signed a non-disclosure so we couldn't tell anyone you know, that we were interested in being on this programme. Um, and then uh, finally, about 10 days before filming started, they said, OK, you're in. That's it. You made it. And I was thinking, oh, what, am I, what have I done? You know, <laughs> what is going on? Now I've got to go to work and ask them for more time off. I've only just come back from the mountains. I've got to ask them for more time off. I can't tell them why. I can't tell them how long I'm going to be away for. Um, so I thought I was going to be in, in trouble there. But um, I went, I had to tell um, someone at the university what I was doing and they agreed to let me go. I told them I'd probably be away for a couple of weeks because I expected I'd be kicked out pretty early on um, and, and off I went. So uh, we arrived, all 12 of us, at a location, um, an airfield actually, and there was Commander Chris Hadfield. So he is a NASA astronaut, he's been to space three times and he's now involved in astronaut selection. So he was going to run the selection, astronaut selection um, programme alongside two other judges, Dr. Ia Whiteley and Dr. Kevin Fong, one of whom is a clinical psychologist and the other is a doctor specialising in, uh, in extreme environment medicine. Um, so the idea was that we would go through a series of tests um, and whoever was uh, struggling with the tests would be asked to leave. So we'd end up with a single, a single winner of the programme. Um, and we never knew when someone was going to be asked to leave. The, the tests were extremely wide ranging. Um, we didn't know what was coming until suddenly we were in a test and we never got feedback at the end of any of the tests. So it was a really immersive experience um, for me. What was your favourite test? Oh, good question. I think my favourite test of all, we were in Sweden and we got to go in a centrifuge. So you sit in a pod at the end of a long arm in a huge circular room and the arm starts spinning around. And it um, puts your body under, in our case, about five times the force of gravity, akin to launching a rocket up into space. And so we are flying in a circle super fast. It feels like our chest has an elephant on it. You know, it feels like we're being squashed. It's hard to breathe. It's hard to speak. Um, it's hard to move your arms or legs. Um, at times, if the blood starts to drain away from your head, you have to really struggle to try and stay conscious. Um, and then Commander Hadfield came over the radio and asked us to read some words in Russian that he'd placed around the cockpit. So words in the Cyrillic script he'd placed and he was asking us to read those. So testing whether our minds were still able to function well when our bodies were under pressure. And for me, that was the most interesting test of all because it was a completely different experience. Um, I've never been in a centrifuge before. I've never experienced 5G. Um, and it was akin to what you would have to go through if you were going to do astronaut selection. So it was a fascinating opportunity. And did you find that that linked back to almost like your mountaineer training? Because, you know, being a high altitude, your mind may not be working as, as well as you'd like, but you're under this huge amount of pressure. I mean, were, were those skills very transferable for you? Yeah, so the programme didn't really assess our academics in any great sense. I, I thought there would be more testing and selection based on um, our capacity for, for physics, for example, or maths or engineering. But actually, that wasn't tested. Instead, it tested a lot of our other personalities uh, and skills that we picked up throughout our lives. And for me, mountaineering made a massive difference because actually that, what that taught me was resilience. So physical resilience and emotional resilience. Um, and what you find when you're being tested day after day after day with no contact with the outside world, um, sitting in an environment that's quite uncertain, that's very unfamiliar, is it's very much like sitting in the mountains, just you never know what's going to happen. You have to be prepared all the time for something unexpected. You have to react quickly when something does happen. Um, and you get more and more exhausted and you have to be able to be sharp mentally, even though you're suffering, you know, real, really from exhaustion, both through the fact that you've been there for weeks and through the fact that you're so high up and there's no oxygen up there. So being a mountaineer and, you know, lots of other things as well. I was a, an elite rower for a while lacrosse player lots of different things they all teach you different skills that you need so teamwork communication again this resilience this idea of being able to cope under pressure um, and that's what they were testing so I think all of those things really helped me in the process yeah what was the most challenging test was there a test where you, where you were really taken outside of your comfort zone 
There were two tests uh, like that that I'll describe to you. The first one I think most people will agree is is going to take most people outside of their comfort zone. You walk into a room, there's a massive swimming pool and a chamber, and you're asked to get inside the chamber with a dry suit on. Um, the chamber is dropped into the water and it fills with water as you're strapped into your seat. And then it starts rotating. So the chamber will, will rotate till it's upside down. Perhaps it will do some revolutions. And you have to stay in the chamber holding your breath, wait for it to stop turning, count to five slowly, which is hard, uh, release your harness and then find an exit and escape from the chamber. And every person had to do that four times. Um, this is really a test of staying calm under pressure because this is such an unfamiliar environment for most of us. Most people would be very stressed out by that. Um, but we have some instructions and we have to be able to follow those instructions. And so that was a tough test for me mentally before I went in because I was worried. I didn't know what to expect. It was really, really unfamiliar. But actually it turned out to be fine. It turned out not to be a problem at all. But that was the one I was worried about as soon as I heard what it would be. Um, the one I think was the toughest which doesn't sound particularly extreme, but we had a panel interview with five people, five experts. Um, it was 45 minutes long for each candidate. And they were really asking tough questions, quick fire questions, one after the other, making us think on our feet. Um, from things like, if you were in charge of ESA, would you go to the moon or Mars next with your astronauts? To what's your worst nightmare in a relationship? To why... Tell me why you should carry on with this process and why the other candidates should be sent home. So really tough questions. And I found that quite an intimidating environment. Um, so I did OK in that test, but it was definitely one that I didn't enjoy. Were you quite sort of shocked and surprised when when you were selected because you won the cold competition, which was absolutely amazing? It was a total surprise to me to be an absolute winner. I was so sure it was going to be one of the others. I was standing on the podium at the end. We, we finished in the Science Museum. We each gave a three-minute presentation, um, and then they announced the winner. And I was standing in the middle of Kerry and Tim, the other two finalists, just sort of ready in my mind to just hug whoever it was that was selected, because I was so sure it wasn't going to be me. Um, that when they read my name out, I, yeah, I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked. I, I didn't know how to react, really. I was so surprised. I was so sure it, it wouldn't be me. So, yeah, that was, um, that was quite a moment there in the Science Museum. Is it still a dream of yours to go into space as an astronaut? Yes. And actually, the process has really helped me with that dream. So I, I thought about it a lot, but it was such a dream. I, I figured, you know, probably it'll never happen. But um, now I have a letter of recommendation from Commander Chris Hadfield, the, the NASA astronaut, so that when the European Space Agency opens its applications, I'll have this letter of recommendation, um, which I think... It's going to be really helpful for my application. Um, but also just going through the testing made me even more enthusiastic about the idea of being an astronaut. Finding out more about what's involved and what skills you need um, made me really think seriously about it. So, yes, it's definitely a dream of mine to, to go ahead with that application. So when do you know when the European Space Agency is going to open its doors? No. And the last time it did was in 2008 when Tim Peake applied. So it's been a long time since they've had astronaut selection. Um and we don't know where the next one will be. So it could be in just a few years or it could be five or ten years down the line, in which case I'll be too old to apply. So um, just keeping my fingers crossed it sometime soon. Oh, my God. It's so God, it's so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see like more more women in, in space because I know actually I know like obviously everyone's I think has heard of Tim Peake, but he wasn't actually the first British person in space. It was actually a woman. Yeah. yeah. But I can't remember her name, which is so awful. Very charming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I'd love to see more women in space. That would be epic. So in terms of what's next for you, what are you, are, are you back in like the, uh, the writing and the academic world? Have you got um, any more um, expeditions coming up throughout this year? So I'm definitely back in the academic world. Yes, absolutely. Um, buried in grant proposals, paper writing, teaching, lecturing, that kind of thing. So at the moment, that's what I'm focusing on. Um, but also I initiated a massive outreach program back in October as soon as the final episode was aired. Um, I decided that I would tweet. I was quite naive. I just joined Twitter. I thought I would tweet out that I wanted to do more outreach. Um, and then I found out just how many schools there are in the UK because I got hundreds of responses from people saying, please come to our school. Please talk to our students. We'd love to hear more. Um, so in the three months that I've been in the UK since since October, um, I've spoken to 10,000 children um, about 
maybe dreams of being a scientist, what it's like to be a real scientist, or thinking about what it takes to be an astronaut, or maybe even just thinking about the skills that we need in our lives and how we develop those skills um, through the sport and the other activities that we do. So outreach is now a massive part of what I'm doing. Um, of course, I still have to do my normal job, so I'm really uh, working some long days to try and fit everything in, but I'm finding it really rewarding. Um, so, so that's sort of really what I'm doing in terms of day-to-day life. Do you know what? That is so fantastic. And also for you for you to be going out there as a woman, as a scientist, as a doctor, doing what you do and having had this experience, it's it's so valuable. It's not only for the, for, for boys, but for, for young girls and women growing up to say, oh, wait, I can be academic and I still can climb mountains. And actually, if I want to be an astronaut, I can go and be an astronaut. There's nothing to stop me. No, exactly. So I think what I don't have to do is go and talk about women in science. I don't even have to bring it up because actually what I think is that it's enough for me just to stand at the front of the room and talk to them. It's enough for them to see someone doing what they want to do, maybe, you know, when they grow up, to, for them to believe that they could do it. Yeah. So trying to be a female role model for all the girls up there who are, who are growing up thinking about being scientists um, is, is really a goal for me. Um, and then in terms of mountaineering, yes, I'm hoping to head back to the Andes um, in the autumn to go and climb some of those uh, Peruvian 6,000 metre mountains, uh, if possible, but we'll have to wait and see whether the university let me go. Your, your university sounds amazing, to be honest. <laughs> they're, they're fantastic, honestly. Leicester is such a great place to work. I have such supportive colleagues um, and they're really helping me out when I, when I have to be away to climb or when I have to be away for outreach. You know, we work together as a team and I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. I mean, you obviously, you've got a huge amount going on, with, you know, with the outreach, with the mountaineering, with even the planning, with the writing, trying to do your research and publish papers and do all the teaching. Mm. Um, and I, I hate asking this question because I feel as though women always get asked this question. Mm. But I, I'm generally really interested, and I think our listeners will be as well, is in, how do you balance your life? Like, how do you fit in training with everything else that you have going on? I don't think I have a well. That's a, that's a good question. Do I have a well balanced life? For my purposes, yes. But I think most people would disagree. Um, so I rowed for years. I was a rower for years. And when you row, you get up at four o'clock in the morning, drive to the boathouse, train for a few hours, go to work, come back to the boathouse, train for a few hours, and then go to bed. Um, and so early mornings is something I've been used to for a really long time. So I get up at five and go running, and then I get to work at seven in the morning. Um, work a pretty long day. And then in the evening, I do rock climbing or capoeira or I'm learning languages, something in the evening, some kind of activity to improve my skills and something I enjoy. Um, and often a sport, so a couple of different sports in a day. And then go to sleep and do it all again the following day. So it's long days of work, but bracketed by things I really enjoy doing, like running or rock climbing. How do you get enough sort of rest and recovery in to ensure that you're not getting overtrained or exhausted or run down? I think that so running first thing in the morning is great for me. I've been doing it for maybe 15 years. So my body's really used to getting up and going straight out the door. Um, I find that, that a fantastic way to wake up and sort of start my day. I feel really mentally sharp when I've come back from a run, had a shower and gone straight to work. So that's helpful. Um, then, of course, my day job, often I'm either lecturing or I'm doing outreach which I do find quite exhausting, um, or I'm doing research at my desk. So I'm not running around physically, although depending on the outreach, it can be can be quite exhausting. Um, and then in the evening I do something again, which is probably um, more, more physically tiring. So I kind of bracket my day with, with physically tiring things. And in the middle, it's more mentally exhausting. Um, but I don't have a TV. I never sit down on the sofa or anything. Um, I've just always kept this busy um, and that's kind of the way I like my life to be. Yeah. And do you run every day? And how far do you run? I run about five miles um, in the mornings and I try and do it as many days as I can. So if I get back late from doing outreach on the other side of the country, then maybe I'll let myself sleep for a bit longer. But what I found is the key for me to training in the morning, because training is brutal and you're going to suffer and maybe it's not going to be fun. Um, but the key for me is routine. So as long as my alarm goes off at the same time every day, I don't even question the fact that I'm going to get up and go running. It's just what I do. It's what I've done for years. Um, and I think that's a good way for me to to cope with waking up sometimes and thinking, you know, if you let yourself, you think, oh, I don't really want to today. It's raining outside or it's frosty outside. So I think the routine is what really helps me to, to keep that going. Oh, definitely. A hundred percent. I'm exhausted hearing you. 
<laughs> it's like, oh my God, wow, that's awesome. But actually, I suppose, you know, you do, you've got these big dreams, these big goals. And, you know, if you do want to become a future astronaut, then you, are you learning Russian? Yeah, a little bit. So actually, the language I'm really focusing on is Portuguese, um, which turns out to be a tricky language. I'm not naturally good at languages, so, you know, I'm working hard at it. Um, and I'm also trying to learn Russian, kind of Portuguese. I go to language classes and I'm, I'm working really hard at Russian. I'm trying to learn a little bit in my spare time as much as I can. Um, but I think one of the lessons that I talk to people about when I go and talk in schools is about challenging ourselves and about trying to take up hobbies and activities that we aren't good at, because it's really easy for me. It would be easy for me just to carry on rowing and running. And they're the things that I know I'm good at, whereas languages I'm bad at and I'm trying to work on that skill. So, um, yeah, just trying to fit in enough time for, for languages and, and other activities that, you know, I don't have any talent at, but I'm working at is pretty important. No, absolutely. And what do you do for, for fun? Or is, do you love everything you do? Oh, all of it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love everything <laughs> I do. Exactly, exactly. And again, maybe that's the key to packing so much into a day is the fact that I really enjoy it. My job is stressful, really stressful. The hours are long, but it's diverse. Um, I get to engage with students and do outreach and all that kind of thing. Um, and then, yeah, all the activities I do, I've chosen to do. So I enjoy those. Absolutely fantastic. Susie, honestly, I'm just blown away by by what you what you've done that you're doing and that you're going to do have you got any like final words of advice anything that you've learned from any of the areas that you work in that you sort of apply to your life and you you think that others will get benefit from gosh I would say that looking back over my life I have taken every opportunity that someone handed me or that I even saw I've gone for everything um that there's been a possibility I might be able to achieve um I think people often are quite afraid of failure because it's something that is going to make all of us uncomfortable. But actually, I failed a lot. I failed at a lot of things. All the things I took up that I was bad at, I was really bad at to start with. But persistence, working hard, and even though you're not doing well, means you can overcome some of those barriers and develop some of those skills. So I think being persistent, taking opportunities as they arise, not being afraid to have a go at something if you don't think you're going to be able to do it, that's what opens doors for you. Um, and then just a lot of hard work, really. I've, I've been lucky with some of the opportunities, but I have worked really hard to, to get to the place that I'm in now. So just years of dedication, I think, is, is what it takes. Absolutely, 100%. Oh, Susie, thank you so much for, for coming on the Tough Girl podcast to share more of your story. Absolutely inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank you. How are we doing, Tribe? I hope you're all well. I hope that has inspired you to set your alarm clock for five in the morning and to go out for a run. Start your day correct. Just want to do a couple of shout outs to members of the Tough Girl Tribe who have been absolutely smashing it. Massive well done to Rita Borg, B-O-R-G, who did her first pull up. Absolutely awesome. Absolutely fantastic. Can I just say, I know how hard it is to do pull ups. And the first one is, is the most difficult. When I was trying to do pull ups, the first time um I think it took me about four months to be able to do my first pull-up and uh, after coming back from the Appalachian Trail I've actually lost all of my upper body strength and I can't do pull-ups anymore so I'm back on the bands which is still a great thing to do and I'm working slowly 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 back up to it massive well done to Ray Red as well who keeps who's upped her distances again this week which is fantastic just to keep doing it gradually 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 I think you upped it by about 10% which is fantastic massive well done and Catherine Harrison your first 30 plus mile week well done especially getting out when the snow is like two meters high that is a really really tough day so you did it so massive congrats on that equally well done to Ellen Piercy for working with her family to get her little Canadian cousin's 16 month old daughter up to Mole Arthur absolutely fantastic and I'm glad you enjoyed the cake that is brilliant cake is an integral part of every single expedition just want to say a really uh, well done to Hannah McEwen who shared the cutest photo of her little one wearing this gorgeous <coughs> excuse me little box cake uh, Cap, which looks fabulous nice to get outside when the weather has started to be a little bit nicer and it's not quite as cold as it has been uh, massive well done for uh fiona uglivy 
O-G-I-L-V-I-E for the running the Strahaven Half Marathon. Absolutely fantastic. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Keep on training um, for your marathon. I know it's tough going, especially when it's dark outside, but you just got to keep putting in keep putting in the work just you know when the alarm goes off get out of bed go to the gym put your trainers on get running but massive well done congrats to emily pitts as well who is smashing her 10k training keep working on your speed work you will break that 50 minute 50 minute barrier i know you can do it you will get there and i think as alison MacArthur said as well just keep putting in the maximum effort keep being consistent and just go for it you will get there well done to Ellen Reinald, who completed her 30-day vegan challenge. Not an easy thing to do when you start making changes to your diet, but you did it. And I'm glad you um, celebrated with pizza. Absolutely fantastic. Well done to Alison Lauder, who attended her first beach litter cleanup, which is absolutely fantastic. It's so important. There is so much pollution on beaches. I'm just so glad that you went out and did something about it. And I think, I mean, one of the things that you wrote that was you know, inspiring to see whole families out there picking up plastic litter, but you are actually making a massive difference. And that was with the final straw, Emsworth. So, you know, absolutely brilliant way to spend the weekend and a great thing for children to, to see as well and to also learn about rubbish and what it does to the beautiful environment that we live in. And you know what I love hearing about is when the Tough Girl tribe work together to achieve their goals. So Sophie Thompson did a little shout out to Cassandra Marilla. I hope I'm saying that right, Marilla, um, for helping her get back into the gym, getting lifting again and squatting again. So that's absolutely fantastic. And Sophie, well done for getting back into the gym. It's not hard when you've been away for quite a while. You sort of get out of your routine, you get out of your habits and everything just doesn't seem to work as efficiently. I'm definitely struggling with that at the moment. My right knee is causing me so many issues and I can't squat, I can't hop, I can't really do what I want to be able to do. But now I actually feel as though I've got like my energy levels back and I, and I want to start pushing it and taking to the next level but I actually just can't do it so I do have a physio appointment booked in next week so I'm going to see an amazing lady called Kat who helped me out um must have been around this time last year actually when I was training for the Appalachian Trail because my glutes weren't firing so we've got my glutes firing which is amazing but now hopefully she'll be able to sort out my right knee which um which is my current problem which I will get fixed also bit of an overshare but I think it's very important ladies make sure you book in your smear test something I do not look forward to doing but I received my letter in the post saying please do come in for your checkup and I have booked it for next week as well it's not it's not fun it's not pleasant but it's just one of those things you have to suck it up and just go and do it so if you received your letter please do go and book an appointment if you haven't um, call up your doctors, call up your nurses, book an appointment. Well done to Daphne, who was running in New York City, running in Central Park. Absolutely fantastic. What a stunning place to go and run, especially when it is cold as it is um, in New York City at the moment. So massive well done. So just, I, I'm sorry I can't mention everybody, but I do just want to say it's so great. Every Sunday in the Tough Girl Tribe, I get to read all of these updates and find out what you've been up to. Um, massive thank you to Alison MacArthur, who runs this. So every Sunday, Sunday. Um, I think it's around like five o'clock or six o'clock. We get uh, this reminder where you get to share your achievements, where you know you, you can share what you've done, what you've achieved, or what you've struggled with, or what you've learned from the week. And it's just very inspiring to see how people are progressing through the year because we are coming up to halfway through February, and people have probably forgotten about their goals for the beginning of, their year, of the year, their New Year's resolutions. So please don't forget, get out your piece of paper, get out your vision board, and just make sure to have a look to see, are you on track? Are you doing everything you need to be doing to, to make your goals and dreams a reality? And sometimes, you know what? Not to be too miserable, but it does, you know, it takes hard work. It takes dedication. It's not going to happen overnight. You've got to persevere. You've got to keep doing it, even when you think you're not very good at it, because everyone starts out as a beginner at once and it takes time to get good at anything. And I was chatting with my parents the other day about, you know, when was the last time you did something for the very first time? When was the last time you did something new? And for me at the moment, you know, doing my university course, I'm definitely outside my comfort zone, reading academic literature, reading academic material. It's, I haven't done this for like 12 years and it is really um, testing me, not physically, but mentally. And it is a challenge in its own right. So I know that you are all going to be facing challenges out there, whether they are physical, whether they are mental, whether they're emotional challenges. But I just want to say, just keep persevering, keep being, keep being resilient. 
keep focused, you will get to where you want to get to. It's just going to take time and hard work. Keep positive, keep the right mindset, keep the right mental attitude and you can do it. Thank you so much for listening to the Tough Girl podcast. Little shout out to some of my favorite patrons who have been supporting um, the podcast. I really do appreciate it. Um, You guys just, I honestly can't do it without you. So every month, individuals contribute between $2 and $25 a month, which is amazing. That's for the Tough Girl Gold Award. Um, But yeah, go and check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Tough Girl podcast. And you can come and join the other 170 patrons who are helping to support me. God, I, I remember back when I started Patreon, I, first of all, I couldn't pronounce it. So I was like, Patreon, Patron, Patron. It was ridiculous, very embarrassing. Um, but now I can say it, Patreon. And I started out with like three or four individuals. And it's just amazing how much it has grown. So I, one of my goals is to get to 250 patrons. So that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, It's all about small contributions, small regular financial contributions, which makes a difference. You know, you can sign up to be, um, you know, a superstar, $5 a month. You get good karma. You get your name listed on the patrons page at Tough Girl Challenges. You can also come and join the Tough Girl Tribe, which is a closed Facebook group, which is only open now to to patrons, basically. Um, You can also become a Tough Girl Legend. Um, where you get all of the above, but you also get shout outs from me on the Tough Girl Twitter account, which is pretty obviously awesome. I love that as well. Um, Total Tough Girl, you get the good karma, you get your name listed on the patrons page, you get to become a member of the Tough Girl tribe, you get regular shout outs on Twitter, you also get to hear your name on the Tough Girl podcast, which is obviously fantastic. Um, so I do just want to say a massive thank you to Louise Johnson for becoming a patron. My sister as well. I haven't given a shout out to Caroline for ages, but Caroline Wellingham, um, thank you. I really do appreciate all of your support. Absolute legend. Um, I also want to say a massive thank you as well to Zoe langley Waitham, um, to my mum, he's a, he's a patron as well, Christine Williams, uh, Katja Lunette, um, Abby Fitzgibbon, uh, Catherine Dufrier, uh, Rochelle Olsen, Dee Kaplinska, you guys are all absolutely fantastic. Angela Davy, Stephanie Langridge, Gillian Pritchard, Nikki Harvison. Thank you so, so much. Um, oh, I, I feel really bad. I feel as though I'm always just saying the same things over and over again. But um, it makes a ra- massive difference having a regular income coming in every single month. If you can't afford to sign up to be a patron at the moment, totally get it, totally understand. But please do go check out my main Facebook page um, where you will get regular updates from myself, from also, you know, like interesting articles, what's been happening, new news that I think is important. A lot of it around, obviously, women, sports, adventure, exploration, Um so that's awesome. Go check that out. Facebook.com forward slash Tough Girl Challenges. I'm also on Instagram at Tough Girl Challenges. I'm on Twitter at underscore tough underscore girl. Send me a tweet. Absolutely love it. Send Susie a tweet as well because she's obviously a fan. Fantastic. I hope she's inspired you um, to, to go after your dreams, go after your goals and um, yeah, to work hard and persevere. Thank you so much for listening. New episodes of the Tough Girl podcast come out on a Tuesday, you know that by now, every Tuesday, 7am UK time. So sign up, subscribe, leave a review, send me an email and uh, yeah, I'll speak to you next Tuesday. All right, lots of love. Bye. (laughs)